yeah, just welcome everyone to our uh, June meetup. Um, appreciate everyone coming. Um, thanks again for the pizza, the hosting, um, BT AI. Uh, appreciate that. And Carson Hatz is going to talk to us today. Uh, he's got a presentation. We're excited. Always great to hear from Carson. This is recorded, so we'll we'll put it on our YouTube channel shortly after this. Um, we're still looking for a meetup presentation next month. So um, we're trying to do these first Wednesday of the month. Uh, if you'd like to present, just let us know. Um, we can do them in person. Or we can also do virtual like we're doing here today. So um, with that, I, I guess we also go around and just ask if anyone's uh, looking for work or if the company's hiring with the economy, we're trying to support that. We also can send out an email to our mailing list and get that information out. So. No updates. Go ahead. Uh, my name is Casey. Um, I work at Johnson. We're hiring. So it's understood. Yeah. yeah. Maybe come talk to me afterwards and we'll get the details on that. Okay. Great. Okay. Cool. Great with that. Let's start the time over to Carson. All right. I was telling uh, Fred earlier, I'm super happy to be up here doing this. I've had this in my head for like a year and a half because I'm. And you'll you'll see. I'm going to get really vehement about it here in a second. Um, it's probably one of the weirdest, nerdiest things I've thought about for this long. Who else? Like, who cares? Who cares? Let's think this much about JSON other than people writing parsers. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me over. I'm really really excited to do this. Um, I'm going to try to keep it within the time frame, but it might go a little long. So I'm going to be looking around. Brad, I'm going to be looking around for like, if there's anybody that's like, all right, Carson, give me the wrap it up. Somebody reel me back in because I will talk all day. Um, so, like I said, my name is Carson Anderson. I work for Weave. I call myself the DevXO. That is a completely made up title. Uh, everyone else makes them up, so why don't I? Uh, basically, the developer experience team is what that stands for, and I'm the, I call myself the executive officer there. Because I kind of make stuff happen. I'm not in charge, but I make it happen for the captain. Um, our job is to build the tooling our developers need to deploy their services, to manage their services, everything around their platform. Uh, it's taken care of. If you're a weak developer, life is really, really good. Uh, and as part of that, I spend a ton of time looking at YAML and JSON and TOML, not really TOML, but a lot of HCL, and doing DevOps things, which is why I think it's a really, really practical talk for this meetup and this group, is we are all dealing with these formats all day long, and developers, I wish every developer was here, because I'm sort of sick of talking to them about like, no, this is how YAML works, I promise. Um, we just all kind of time, right? We understand our editors, we understand like our languages, but we all kind of just gloss over this thing. I recently, my last talk was on Git. I feel like a lot of developers are like, yeah, I use Git every day, but I don't know it. <laughs> like, and I'm trying to take that away. So we all use YAML and JSON every day, but I want you to know it. So I'm here to kind of end the animosity. And what I'm going to do is, hi, I'm Carson. I'm a big fan of YAML. It's great. I kind of think it's the best, but I promise for most of this, we're going to be really nice to everybody. We're just going to examine people on their own merits. And at the end, I will tell you how good YAML is. And hopefully, we'll get a lot of people that like to slide off YAML. Let's get into it. Uh, this is the whole thing I won't read it, but essentially, what I'm saying is eventually, no matter what you're doing, you're going to have to use one or more of these. This is just a reality of life. Like, we need to parallelize our data. It's not always just loaded to you from some other source and you should be good at this. Um, specifically should, you know, like if you're doing stuff in DevOps, doing things with Kubernetes, or I actually included HCL in here specifically because it's the thing that we all use all the time in Terraform and Evolve Data on Evolve Policy. Um, HCL is this thing that kind of feels like one of these languages. If you ask HashiCorp, it's a syntax, not a data structure. And you'll see it kind of falls flat in a few places. It's but it's, it's actually really great to have it up here. So if you haven't heard of it, even if you don't never use HCL, it gives you context to these other languages. But I'm gonna talk about basically all of these formats today. Big disclaimer, everything I'm talking about, I'm going really rigidly to what the spec says, right? And I'm gonna use the latest YAML spec. I'm gonna use the original JSON spec. Um, the spec means nothing, right? It all matters what your parser does. So just because I tell you something and support it in a markup, like test it with your code first, um, that's also why you see everything I do is running a lot of live code tests. Uh, just for clarity, I'm going to be executing everything I run today to prove to you it's all real. And I'm just using really popular Go libraries. 
You don't have to understand what these are, or how to use them. Just understand, like I'm, I'm. These are the parsers I'm using. Unless you want to, if you want to recreate any of this. So, let's see. I might actually have to start clicking. Uh oh, meeting chat popped up over my thing here. So we're gonna do some primers and then we'll get into it. JSON, JavaScript object notation. This is the most rigid. You're going to find out throughout this that there's very little, like JSON says, do it this way, only this way. We care about almost everything. The only thing JSON doesn't care about are basically white space. White space, you can kind of do whatever you want in JSON. Everything else is really, really rigid about. Um, commas, quotes, all of that has to be where it has to be. There's no choices. People love it for this because there's one way to do it. It also makes a lot of things really painful. Um, next is YAML. YAML is... This actually, I learned this. It stands for YAML ain't markup language. You might actually think it means YAML yet another markup language, what I thought, but no, they retronymed it a while back like they did with RPM and all these other uh, acronyms. It's interestingly, it's a superset of JSON. So if you don't have to do something in YAML, stick in the JSON, it's always valid. I'm showing you this at the bottom. That JSON example is like the JSON code from the previous slide. I could have put white space in there, could have done whatever I wanted and it would just, so. Everybody knows in YAML, so if you don't know something, just stick in the JSON, it'll be valid. Um, it's the most flexible. If you don't understand any of these things up here, don't worry, I'm gonna go over all of them one at a time. Um, let's actually go back and I'm gonna show you how you can see a lot of these examples. So there's this play button. Every time you see an example on that play button, I'm gonna hit it and it's gonna render that code with Go and just show you the Go structs. You don't have to understand Go, I just, I'm gonna point at certain things in here, especially when it's showing you side by side different syntaxes that they all boil down to the same stuff at the end of the day, right? That's all that really matters here. So here's YAML and I'm gonna hit play and I'm gonna prove that, hey, this JSON example here, it really did parse, right? That was the JSON slammed in there and it did parse in YAML and it works just fine. Next is TOML. It's Tom's obvious markup language. I actually find this to be the most confusing. Um, a few things are really simple, but when you get into like deeply nested lists of objects, it can get really kind of twangy. Um, but it's really, really great for simple use cases. People really love it because it's, it's easy to understand. Its spec is the simplest of every spec. Like it's a really well put together web page for the Tom, Tom spec. Like it's easy to understand and read. Um, and it really is designed to be like an INI and that you never nest. If you don't like nesting, you don't like square braces and you don't like white space, Tom is a way that you can never nest in. Uh, we'll see that a lot. And last is HCL, which is HashiCorp's language. It's open source. I mean, you can do things in your program without needing Terraform. Like you can just go get HashiCorp parsers and parse HCL. And it's really interesting because it's a mix of all the others. You'll see it sometimes look like JSON, sometimes look like Tomlin, sometimes look like YAML. It's always just kind of changing. And it's not great at everything. There are a few things that fall flat on, but it's, it's typically pretty easy to read. Um, anybody that's done Terraform will have seen this a lot. And of course, I'm going to be parsing a lot of it and go. So, like I said, we're gonna start by apples to apples. I'm gonna compare very basic types across all of these formats and we're gonna talk about them. And the first thing I'm gonna do is talk about maps, which is a complex type to start with, but I have to start there because HCL and Tom will both say, hey, the root thing that you give to me to parse has to be a key value pair. You can't just give me a string and have me parse it. Like we're document languages and documents are key value pairs. They're not a list. They're not just a string. Like you can have, we've all like got, used an API where it returns JSON that's just like a list, right? That can, you can do in JSON. Tomal says, no, key value is the root of everything and HCL is the same way. They also all use different terms. YAML uses map, HCL and JSON use object and Tomal uses table, which feels the weirdest. They're trying to infer like, it's a very old school computing term, hash table, which is what all these other things are, but it's just, I don't know, that's the term they use. I think it's weird, just use map, but let's start by showing our basic examples. This is really, really basic. I won't go into too much detail. I think you can all understand, but we're going to point out that in JSON, when you're talking about maps or objects, as they call them, it's all curly braces. Curly braces start a map, curly braces end a map, comma separated. Everything has to be quoted if it's a string and you're, we'll get into this, but your keys have to be strings. So really, really basic JSON map, YAML, and I'll, so I'm going to hit heavy on these basic concepts and then we'll breeze through. YAML is all about white space and new lines, right? You could stick the JSON in here and it'd work, and you're gonna see me mix some of that in here to, to prove it to you. But generally it's about white space and new lines and things don't usually have to be quoted. You can quote as much as you want in YAML. If you don't like the ambiguity of YAML, put as many quotes in there as you do JSON. Like you can quote as much as JSON, you just don't have to. Toml is key equal value, it's not the colon. Um, 
And you'll notice that in my YAML, I have to have spaces after colons. YAML's pretty space specific. Toml says, nah, we don't really care about spaces. Um, and you don't have to quote the keys, although you can quote them. We'll get into more detail, but again, just the very bare bones is the first example of me, like, again, running these, printing them out, proving to you that they all serialize down to the same code at the end. Okay, so let's get more complicated. I'm going to get more and more and more complicated on objects to really point out the edges of every one of these structures. So JSON, right, if I'm going to get more advanced, I got to quote everything all of the time. That there's no question about it, and I'm going to point out that especially in JSON, a lot of us are used to using unstrict JSON parsers, right? If you edit your JSON config in VS Code, it's really not rigid. It allows trailing commas. It allows comments. But strict JSON says no trailing commas, right? You have to not have that last thing have a comma. Um, and everything has to be quoted, and keys always have to be strings. YAML says, look, don't quote. Do quote. You do have to quote in cases like this where you have spaces. Or you can do this thing that maybe nobody's heard of, which is really weird, just these type prefixes, exclamation, exclamation mark, and a type name. And there's several of these that you can look up that say like, I'm disambiguating to this, this to you, YAML. This is not a Boolean, no matter what it looks like, I get, or a number, in this case, I'm saying, yeah, that one looks like a number, but it's a string. I could have quoted it. There's reasons you might do one or the other. Most of the time you just quote, but you'll see these type declarators come up a lot. Tommel says, you don't have to quote your, your keys unless they have spaces. And no matter what it looks like, we're going to assume you meant that it's a string, right? HCL says, okay, you just, you know, it's also loose on these quoting, but it would panic. If I didn't quote this number one at the bottom in HCL, it would say, look, I, I don't know, it has to be a string. And you'll see that in a second. So again, diving into the basics, because you're going to see so many maps today. But again, this is them all serializing different ways, including all these weird ways of doing it in YAML. They all converted to strings at the end. All right, let's talk about nesting, right? Because as soon as you start doing any of this, it's really common to have objects with objects with objects, and it gets really, really deep, really, really fast. Um, JSON, again, curly braces to start, curly braces to end. That's what JSON does. You can do white space or not do white space. I'm mixing them in here to prove that it can be on one line or not. YAML says, you know, we are, we're doing significant white space. This is often the most reviled thing of YAML. They, people say, it's like Python, any of these, people hate significant white space, but you're going to see, that's actually a superpower. Um, there's some magic to doing that that allows some features that you don't get when you use quotes. Um, this so far doesn't seem much better. Also remember, you could quote as much of this as you want. You could even just stick the nested JSON. Like I could just stick this JSON right in the job of the YAML and it would work. Um, but other than that, you, you indent and whatever indentation you start, you have to keep that indentation and you're setting nested fields. Uh, Toml is again, Toml wants to be flat. So, you're going to say, look, de describe all the things you want at the top level object. We're going to assume this top level thing. And as soon as you give me these square braces, I'm going to assume everything that follows that is now a field inside that something called that, right? So we're saying, I'm done talking about the top level. Now I want to describe to you the job. The job has this title and this many years. So Tommel wants to keep it flat. There's some other ways to do this, but you're going to see a lot more square braces in Tommel than any other structure. And ACL says, no. It's sort of like, again, kind of like JSON. You can, you got to do curly braces, but it's really agnostic about quotes and trailing commas are fine in HCL. So let's just prove that this is all just a bunch of ways to declare this kind of data structure for my application, right? Um, and it's going to get more and more complicated as we go. I've said this a lot, but I'm going to push on it with one dedicated slide. In JSON and Toml and HCL, you have to have keys in your maps be strings, right? This goes all the way back to JSON being for JavaScript and as being objects, right? And attributes on objects, as far as I'm aware, I'm not a JavaScript guy, it can't be numbers. You can't access person dot one in JavaScript. So they're really rigid about, no, these aren't maps of data, like data, arbitrary data types to something. They're maps of strings to things. Um, YAML is the only one that, of all of these that says, look, your map can be of integers. It can be Booleans, it can be floats. like. Any basically scalar thing that's not another collection type can be a map. Um, so you're going to see, I've, I've called out some specific examples here. But if I parse these, you'll see JSON freaks out because, hey, one is not a string. HCL freaks out because one is not a string. And Tom will said, I know it looked like a number, but it's a string. Like, you don't need to quote it. I know that it's going to be a string. And YAML said, look, yeah, here's this one's a string. Here's an int and a Boolean. Or sorry, an int, Boolean, and a float. Like, YAML's really 
loose about what your keys are, including in this case, mixing within a single map, which is kind of weird, but you can do it. Um, next is key uniqueness. Within an object, these, all these languages have different opinions about uniqueness. JSON and HCL both say, if you repeat a key, the new one will just take the place of the old one. We just overwrite, right? That's repetition overwrite. YAML and TOML both say, uh -uh. like, if I find a key again, I'm going to freak out. Like, because that's ambiguous data and I don't deal in ambiguous data. Like, you got to fix your data. Um, I don't know which one's the right choice. I'm just pointing out, like, they have these kind of weird niche behaviors. Um, and you got to kind of learn what you're doing in the different languages and, and in some cases, what they can describe or not describe. So here's proof that some of those work and some of those don't. All right, now we're gonna get into strings. I've talked a ton about maps. You've seen strings used around, but I haven't really dug into the details of strings. Um, so in JSON, strings always have to be escaped. They all just have to be double quotes and you gotta use escape sequences for anything that we have a double quote in, right? That's just the rule. There's no question about it. Um, you can, if you've never done this, you can put Unicode in there. Pretty much all the languages support Unicode escapes. I mean, it's just another kind of escape. I just put it in here because it's cool to see the characters come in. Um, and so here's me quoting some stuff and always using double quotes. So that's your choice. JSON's easy, one option. Double quote everything and use escapes. And that parses. YAML. YAML, and I'm gonna like to keep leaning on the newest YAML for a lot of this, has a lot of choices for strings. Right, there's a ton and I'll talk most about this. So we've seen the one already where I ain't, gotta, I ain't gotta quote anything. I can say, I don't need to quote. It looks like a string. It's gonna treat it like a string. This gets a little bit weird. If you don't have a color highlighter, if you don't have a syntax highlighter, you might not realize that this comment here is not gonna be part of the string, right? If you want that comment in there, I've got an example where you have to actually literally put quotes around that. Otherwise, as soon as it sees that pound, it assumes you're done with the string. And not only that, you're done with the string and the string ends when the space is start. Kind of weird behavior. Um, syntax highlighters help, but again, all five of these are the same value, just displayed five ways in the app. You can use double quotes, you can use single quotes. There's some nuances I won't go into, but essentially um, single quotes are have no escapes. They have, they have one escape. Um, or you can do this thing that I'm gonna talk about a lot, which is what that magic, that significant white space is called a block scalar. And the truth about this is even after this talk, I just go to multiline yaml.info to figure out how to do multi-line strings in YAML. And they, you fill in some boxes and it tells you what two characters to put after the colon. Um, but this basically says like, look, when you see the two spaces start, everything after that is part of the string. It's really magic, especially when you get down. So I'm gonna show you, here's Booleans, YAMLs. If anyone's using YAML a lot, they know that putting a raw true in there won't be read as a string true unless you quote it. YAML's gonna think that true is a Boolean. Um, so here's some more examples of, again, using the different formats to put a, a literal word true in there and not have it get thought of as a Boolean. But here's the magic. We're going down to the complex examples. YAML says, okay, if you want to put this complex string in here, that you've got a string that has double quotes and single quotes inside it. This is a pain in the butt in a lot of languages. You can single quote it. And YAML says, look, if you're in a single quote and you give me two single quotes in a row, I'll know you mean a literal. It's like the one escape. Backslash n's, backslash r's, those are read literally. But you can add a single quote in. Um, if you use double quotes, you get all the normal escape sequences you're used to. That's not key, that's not in. All that's in, like, available to you in doubles. So single quotes pretty safe to just jam anything. But you can kind of accidentally break it if you have a string that's weird. This is why I love the block scalers. Is I can put single quotes, I can put double quotes. I can put as many single quotes in a row. I can put whatever I want in there. It's going to be that string, literally. It makes it really great for complex multi-line strings. And you'll see that in a second. Um, but that's only possible because you've got a syntax that says, I don't even need a quote. Like white space is my meaningful data. So I'm gonna hit play and just prove that all of these are the same structure all of the time, right? Lots of different ways, but they all serialize down as they go into the code and they're identical. Just to really prove that some of those weird ones work. Toml is also got a lot of options. Not as many as YAML, uh, double quotes, single quotes, triple single quotes and triple double quotes. And those are mostly useful for multi-lines and weirdness. So you'll see, again, I won't go over it too much, but you always got to quote your strings in, in Toml. You just got four different choices of quoters. And if you're in double quotes, you got to escape. If you're in single quotes, like you can't describe the data that I'm giving you here using single quotes in Toml. Tom, because if you're in single quotes, it, the next single quote means the string is done. There's no way to add a literal single quote inside, right? They're saying, look, if you need to add a literal single quote, use these triples. Very Python, right? Very like 
until you see another triple in a row, this allows you to add kind of complex strings in Toml, and you'll see this come up a bit more and still be relatively readable. But again, it's quoting, you just have four options of quotes. So there's no option to not quote, but you have choices with the specific quotes. HCL is more like JSON, which feels really easy. It says double quotes, my, my friend, like double quotes, normal escape sequences, no choices. So here's where it gets more like JSON. Again, you've seen the Unicode come up all the time. They all support escape. Let's talk about really long strings, right? If you're writing configurations, sometimes stuff just runs on and on and on. And no one, no matter how wide our monitors get, I've always got lines that are too long. That's just a truism of life. So here's that string that I'm going to do it in a couple different ways. And let's put that in every language. So here's it in JSON. And I'm condensing this down for vertical reasons. One long string. There's no way to break up a long string in JSON, right? Make it really long in the JSON, nothing you can do. YAML says, look, you cannot quote it and it can be really long. You can double quote it or single quote it and it can be really long. Or here's magic. Scalar. I want you to read, you know, I'm going to start a string on the next line. And I want you to replace every new line with a space. This key three is identical to key one and key two. Every time it hits an end of a line, it goes, look, I know you, I got a new line at the end of this, but you probably want to, what you mean is a space there. And I'm going to stick the next stuff on top. I'm going to stick the next stuff on top. It lets you break up long lines into small vertical segments. Um, there's some other syntax here. I won't show you again. Multi-line YAML.info gives you, like, you want to keep the new lines. There's all sorts of options, but that's magic. Like, what, none of these other ones, well, that's not true. Tom will let you do this. Tom will says, okay, you can double quote things. These triples are where they really come to shine is for multi-line strings. Do triple quotes. Use a backslash is a very like bash-ish style thing. And when I see a backslash and a literal new line in your input, I'm going to ignore them. It's like if you're doing big, long multi-line commands in bash. Um, the trick is, of course, this. You have to put your quotes at the end of the thing. Otherwise, you'll get a trailing new line. Did you hear how that works in Bash? Yeah. Really, really Does it? Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> so yeah, and then HCL, um, you might think there's a solution for this in HCL for in here docs, but it's not quite right, right? All of these strings I'm going to print have no trailing new one, right? If I scroll to the very end of this, there are these long strings and there's no backslash n at the end of any of these quotes. And you can get 90% there in HCL um, with this thing called here docs that I'll show you in a second. Um, but it kind of falls apart with like that, avoiding that last bit of data. So again, you can do it in all these languages. I'm just showing you some are easier than others at certain things. Now let's do multi-line strings. So in this case, I want to have line one and line two as a string in each of these formats. JSON, use backslash n, my friend. That's what you do, single quote, double quotes. YAML says, okay, you can do that, right? I can stick the JSON in there or Here's a slightly different one. Instead of the great, or less than, whatever it is, um, instead of an arrow and a hyphen, I can do a hyphen and a hyphen. And it says, okay, well, I'm going to keep those new lines now. Like, you can still put them on there. I'm going to keep it. And the hyphen says, take the trailing one off the end. Um, Tommel, again, double quotes. But if I want to not have that trailing one, this isn't a super big deal for most of us. Most of us just leave trailing new lines on the end of everything. But I'm just describing an edge. Um, HCL, again, you might, you can do double quotes. This is what you would do most of the time. This gets you almost there. If you've not seen this and you're writing Terraform, please. Your docs are amazing for putting scripts in line in your Terraform. Like if you need to put a big bash script in there, you can do that with, you know, just like in Mesh, you do an EOF and it'll say, look, I'm going to keep reading everything as a string until I get to the next EOF on its own line. And then the string is done being fed to me. Like they're really, really useful. 99% of the time in Terraform, you leave that entirely new line, it doesn't hurt. But I just want to prove that it's not exactly right because of this, right? So there's this like, and if you Google this, like how to get the last, get rid of the last new line in a Terraform here doc, and they say, use Terraform trim. I'm like, that's not HCL, that's Terraform. This, the language itself or HCL itself doesn't provide for that. Not a problem, but just an A. Now let's get really weird. This is a literal string I wanna stick somewhere, right? There's all sorts of weird stuff. There's spaces, there's multiple levels of spaces. You can't see it, but the thing to the left there is a tab. And I wanna stick that string into all of these formats. JSON says, all right, you got to use backslash ins, backslash t's and quotes. YAML says you can do that, or <laughs> I put backslash tab in here to be mean to YAML. If it was a space, it wouldn't matter. Uh, and in fact, it doesn't matter. This works. Key2 works. But unless you're in an editor where you can see the difference between tabs and spaces, it's hard to tell that there's two leading spaces here and then a tab. But it works. You'll see it for now. I'm just showing you like, 
even this, this magic can get a little weird in some edge cases, even though it works. Tomal, again, these quotes and HCL, new lines. So YAML, Tomal, both of them are much, much better at multi-line strings. That's the takeaway here. That's just, they're all better at them. Or long strings. Those are the languages for describing complex strings. But it's all the same. Even the YAML one that's a little scary because you can't quite see it without highlighting um, does work. Let's talk about lists. So we talk a lot about maps, we talk about strings. Let's go next to lists of things, right? Ordered um, lists of items. So for us, we're going to make a list of the string true and the Boolean false. JSON, square braces. We've all done this. This is what we do in most languages. It's a lot of square braces. Um, again, really rigid about that trailing comma. Don't put it there. It's not valid JSON for really strict parsers. YAML says, okay, well, you can do that. You can you can start square braces. And if you start square braces, look, you can even do weird white space stuff. You think YAML is really sensitive to white space. It is until you use braces and then it doesn't care. You can, you could this, I didn't show an example, but this applies to maps. Use a curly brace to start a map in YAML. You can do weird white space stuff and it'll treat it more like JSON. Um, or the real common one in this is, I'm going to say, start my thing, colon, new line, and hyphen, right? Hyphen says, starting a new list item. Here's the thing. Hyphen, starting a new list item, here's the thing. And again, I'm being really obtuse by purposely like declaring that this is false, even though I didn't need to, just to show you that there's all these weird, these, not weird, these data type declarators in a way. Um, Tomo says, curly braces, we're just more, we're we'll let you do white space, we're not sensitive about trailing commas. And HCL in this case is exactly like Tomo, this kind of example. You'll see cases like this. So there it is, those are all those being parsed in all different languages and they all work. So I think this is the one that I see people get tripped up a lot with YAML and like the hyphen and not understanding that. Is, is two spaces required and sometimes it's yeah, without indication on the list. Yeah, the list can be, lists can be zero to any. Maps have to be one to any. I always like to do the two because otherwise it is wrong. I don't know, but you're right. It's it would be valid for all of these for the list items to have zero leading spaces in you know in front of all of them. It can kind of be flatter to. Um, all right, let's talk about booleans. This is a big one. If you ever done YAML, you're going to see a page that'll be scary. <laughs> JSON says lowercase true, lowercase false. Those are the booleans. That's it. YAML, the earliest versions especially, said no. Here's a regex on the right. All of those, I'm going to treat like yes or no in their various formats. This was the dumbest idea I've ever heard in my entire life. Like, this is no value. There's no reason you couldn't have just standardized on true and false. Like, this is over flexibility 101, right? Like, and it's the cause of a lot of YAML pain to the point of like, because um, you'll notice I have keys over here that are all intended to be strings. But if I didn't have this on these literal trues and falses on the left, if I didn't quote them or otherwise tell YAML, hey, this isn't a I know this looks like false, but it's a string. Um, it would read them as Boolean. And that same thing happens on the right. So again, quote, quote your YAML strings if you're ever not sure. Um, lots of different ways to do this. I didn't show you them all. HTML and Tomo both said, nah, true, false. So we hit the prey on these. We see, yep, all those things in YAML and more <laughs> are true, falses. The newest spec says, true, false is the canonical. We still have to support old things. They really want you to go on true and false, and I encourage you to do that. I myself got in the habit of using yep in places where I wanted to just put garbage to like prove something because I knew YAML didn't think yep was the true. <laughs> um, or you can just quote. Next is null. So make a map of where this, you have the string key to null, right? JSON, you can do it with just null, all lowercase. YAML has some more options. Again, you can do everything from all the various capitalizations of null to tilde to just not. YAML says, I don't know, if it's, there's nothing there, then I guess it's null. Like, I don't like that, but it's supported. Tomo says, null isn't a thing. The spec says, we don't believe in null. Null doesn't exist. There's always something. Um, and HCL says you can do null, but even there, I'm, if you look, remember from the beginning slides, I used HashCorp's parser, and it doesn't know what null is. So the spec doesn't mean anything. Check your code. But there you go, there's proof that JSON has nulls, YAML has nulls, and all the different flavors, and the other two say, eh -eh. well, kind of. And HCL says, yes, if your code supports it. Comments, this is a fun one. JSON, strictly speaking, has no comments. Everything else is pretty straightforward. Um, YAML and all the other ones use pound sign to start a comment. They allow you to have comments coming after the line. I already talked about the weirdness with strings a little bit with, with pound sign showing up in there. 
um, all the flexibility of comments that you would expect from any other like code language. JSON says, no, you can't do it, strictly speaking. I know we all see these in places where we use non-standard parsers. And I looked this up and the reason why I was looking at this building this, apparently some of the earliest people, one of the other people developing JSON, early versions, he saw people using comments to provide instructions to parsers. To say like, the next thing is this, treat it this way. And because a couple people misused a feature that could have been supported from the start, right? We nobody gets it. Like it's really unfair because why can't you just do like that? Sounds like a problem with the people writing the code, not a people the, the language shouldn't try to babysit you that much, but no. So strictly speaking, no comments, although you probably used a parser that lets you do slash star and star slash, right? Really common. Uh, like JSON stuff, or sorry, JavaScript style comments in JSON. Um, but there you go. There's all the things to prove, like, hey, you got to be careful with those pound signs if you want them to be literal, quote them. That was that example I talked about earlier. It's like, this doesn't get the comment in there when I quote it or when I put it in this block scalar, you got to keep that comment as actual text in the string. 99% um, of the time, this stuff bugs people when they're like templating YAML and they don't quote stuff and they just jam any old thing into YAML at the other side of a YAML and don't check to see if it has pound signs and they lose half their text. I'm not saying it's happened to me, but. <laughs> Next is numbers. In JSON land, you may have noticed in the earlier slides, there's no distinction. Numbers are numbers. They can be an inch, they can be a float. Whatever your language decides is the default, like the spec says no difference. Um, but you can do cool things. You may not know you can do exponential notation in your JSON numbers. YAML's fun because you can do all those things. It, it makes a distinction between ints and floats as separate unique items in the spec. You can do exponential, or you can do these underscores. So if you have long numbers, underscore them in your YAML, make them human readable. Uh, Toml does the same things. The syntax highlighter doesn't like it, but I trust, but I promise you'll see it's real. Again, <laughs> underscores are allowed. And HCL says, yeah, we support the different types. All the other parsers make a distinction um, in the, like, of course, your application can read whatever it wants. It can say all of those are floats or all of those are not floats and deal with it. But the, the data structure in a lot of cases has requirements. So let's parse this and just prove. Yeah, the Go says, look, if you don't tell me what it is, I'm going to assume every number in a JSON is a float. That's what Go does. Another language today, it's all ints, doesn't matter. But you can see in YAML, I don't have dot zero at the end because that didn't become a float inside the, the code. Um, but other than that, all those long numbers, all those weird things, they didn't parse to numbers. Um, so really nice that a lot of these other formats have options to make them human readable. Date times are interesting. Uh, JSON and HCL both say, like, put in a string. I don't, I don't know what a date is. I know strings. You do something with strings. YAML and TOML both are saying, like, no, you can, if there's strings in a certain, there's still strings, if they're in a certain structure, or if you explicitly tell me with this type, this is where it gets really, really useful to say, this is a timestamp. If it's not a timestamp when you read it, like, that was a problem with me. Don't just try to treat it like a string. Um, they will have ways of saying, like, look, when I see a string that looks like this in this ISO standard, I know you meant that to be a timestamp, not just a string. Tom will picks a different one and has, again, a few options for whether you use a time or not a time, or you can optionally just not put a T and use a space to make it. Tom wants, Tom wants to make everything superhuman readable. But if we hit go on these, you'll see JSON and HCL both just found strings, the Go parser. And I don't get, I'm not giving, when I do these Go parsers, I'm not telling you what types are. I'm just saying, like, put it into whatever you think it is in Go. Um, and so it says, oh, yeah, no, I saw those. Like, they're all times except for this one that the spec says it supports, but my parser doesn't. Again, really popular Go parser, but they all make decisions about what they do. So if you wanted to really make sure it was going to be new in the date format. Yeah, I'm showing you all the examples. If, if I was doing it, I would do all of them with the canonical format for these, right? Or if I was doing it in Tom, I'd probably do the bottom format because it's human readable. Yeah. Um, so that's what I would do. I, I, just proving that there's like all these myriad ways that the, the spec goes, oh yeah, those are times. All right, complex structures. So now we've done basic types. We all understand when you see a list, you know what a list is, you see maps, you see strings, like this is, you, this sounds easy, but I, I've talked to people, I'm like start a list and yeah, in the YAML document, they're like, oh, what do you mean? Like, how do I make a list? Okay, so we all can do that. And that's good because we're gonna build on this a lot for real world things. We're gonna do, First complicated data structure, an object that has a nested array. Not that complicated, we've actually already seen it. When I talk about lists, I built maps with lists in them, but you know, here's JSON and YAML. 
And I'm proving out some of the examples about YAML spacing. You can see here, so like specifically, the JSON is not complicated. Everybody understands JSON. There's one way to do it. Just deal with your commas. <laughs> YAML says, look, you can do the JSON thing. You can do the like weird white spacey stuff with once you start the square braces. Or zero, one, two, ten, thousand. When you're doing lists, you know, it doesn't matter. It's when you do maps, it has to be at least one space. Otherwise, I think it looks the same object. But lists can be really flat. I tend to prefer some amount of space because I like my lists to stick out a bit more. But you see parsers make decisions about whether or not to, to do this. YAML says it's all good. So if I hit plan here, these parse the same in all the languages. Um, with the unique, unique distinction here that floats and numbers, you can see here on the YAML, the floats are floats, numbers are numbers, and the JSON, the floats are floats, and the numbers are floats because they don't care. Again, there's no, your code can do what it wants, but the spec says. Tom and ACL are pretty much the same. In fact, this is the same code, right? Like, they just jam the same thing in here. It's like, yeah, use square braces and commas, trend commas, I don't care. Um, that's pretty straightforward to do these things in these languages. And they parse the same way, and they have the distinction between floats and ints. Um, that's not too bad. So JSON and YAML is what I want to call out there. Do it the other way. Let's do an array of objects. Another hyper common thing. You'll see this mixed up in a real world use case in a second. Um, we got an array of things that all have their own attributes. So JSON says start the people, and that's a list of people, and every person has these attributes about them, and square braces and curly braces, you get the drift. YAML says, okay, and this is, again, I don't blame people. This throws them because they don't quite understand. They understand the hyphen and really simple use cases of strings and bools, but they don't understand that, like, okay, there's two kinds of white space. There's what starts the new list entry, and then there's where do other elements of that object live together, right? So these, again, the same structure here. These first three lines after people are three attributes of the first element in that list. And then next three lines, once I have a new hyphen, so I'm starting a new element, now these are all attributes of that element. Not too bad, um, but it does throw people if they're not used to YAML. And again, if you don't know it, it's JSON, it'll be that way. Um, but these all parts the same way. Let's do this in Tom. Tom, this is where Tom gets the weirdest thing. And half the reason I did this talk is I didn't understand what this was when I looked at it in a Tom document. Um, Tom says, every time I see double square braces and the, a, a key, I'm going to assume you're starting a new element in a list where the key is called the thing between the braces, right? So I'm saying, here's the first thing in the people list. And everything you see in there belongs to that first person. And then as soon as you see another thing, you're saying, I'm done with that person, the next person. Not too bad for simple use cases when it gets nested and nested and nested. It can be really, you have to have like special syntax to break out of like, it can be really weird for very complex structures. Let me just tell you, um, you don't have to do this. You could always, of course, stick square, or square braces in. HCL says, no, we're like JSON, but a little more flexible about our quotes. So again, Tom is the weirdest one for me, but it is the same thing. And it tries to be flat. Tom says, we're going to be flat. No nested. You know, so far, Tom's not nested at all, unless I really wanted to. So let's do a real world example. I took a tiny snippet of the run instances API call from AWS and said, here's a piece of this document they're expecting me to post to them to start some instances. And it's got nested objects. It's got lists of things with nested things inside those things. Like this is a real document with real combination of everything we've seen so far. So let's describe this kind of pseudo stuff in every format. Uh, you don't have to understand this, but you're going to see, like I actually made go types for this to show you a real world use case. And when I print them, you're going to see these in the output. Don't worry about them. You just don't be surprised when you see these names pop up later. Um, here's the JSON. I'm using a lot of white space and indentation to make the JSON human readable. You could of course make it super flat. Uh, not too bad. Everything here is readable. There's no choices. There's no questions. It's like you do the thing JSON does. I won't go over it because there's no, there's no weirdness, right? It's straightforward. Uh, people love it for this. As long as you remember to do all the quotes and you don't have very complex strings, it's great. Here's the YAML. I know that looks like JSON, but I want to drive home. I just fed that into the YAML parser, including the leading square brace or curly brace. The YAML parser says, cool, that's an object. Like you can always just stick including an entire JSON document and throw it out as something that takes YAML and it'll work. Um, so never forget that part because if you don't know how to do it in YAML, you do, it's JSON. Here's the real YAML though, may not be here. 
uh, I'm not doing footing, right? I'm doing a lot of stuff here. I'm saying, look, a lot of this, I'm doing it by hand. I can kind of see this. I don't need to quote most of these things, but you do enough YAML, you get a feel for when you need quotes. I could aggressively quote all the keys and values here. I could, and it would be valid YAML. If I'm not sure, I could do as much quoting as I do in JSON and it would still be valid YAML. Um, this gets pretty readable. In fact, I'm showcasing some few things. Here's that first block device mapping and the nested object on multiple lines. I'm also showing you, hey, here's that second list element and I'm doing an inline YAML block that's JSON-ish, and it lets you kind of, you can squish things a little flatter to your heart's content up or down in YAML to, to make things more or less readable. Um, again, the same document, I don't, I could have them both be long or short. But I print this out, that marshals just fine into all these structure types. Tommel, you might be tempted to try to be json and do these like braces. And if you did that, you have to so you use braces, especially specifically curly braces in Tommel. Tommel says once you put a curly brace on there, that curly brace is means you're setting an object and it has to end on the same line. Tommel's really weird about in what they call inline tables. So if I try to run this, um, it's going to work, but it's not superhuman readable. But if I didn't know Tommel very well, I might think that's the way to do it in Tommel. I might then again these are two wrong examples. I'll show you the right. Then I might say, well, that's ugly in Tommel. I'd like to do this kind of bracy stuff. JSON-ish without being super strict. You hit this, Tom's gonna say like, sorry, no, like once you start that curly brace, it has to end on the same line. So when you're good with Tom, you've done a lot of Tom, you'll write canonical Tom, which again, very flat, lots of double square braces and square braces. So I'm saying, here's all the attributes that live at the top of the document. Here are all the attributes under placement and inside placement, here's the first device, here's the second device. And when you, if you read this, again, this is the same thing we've been looking at already two times. It might be, honestly, this is why I did this talk. I didn't know what the heck this was doing. Like what structure did this marshal to in JSON? I'm trying to write JSON or go structs to fit this data. I'm like, I don't know how it's gonna, everything else I can pretty much just do. Um, but yeah, I'm saying like, here's the placement and here's the first element in the block device mappings key in placement. And again, it can get really deep and really flat. You can also do this thing, I, I'm showcasing it here. Tomo's magic is dot notation. Tomo says, like, you, you don't, Tomo's the only one of these that says, if you want to do a thing and a thing and a thing and a thing, you don't need indentation, you don't need curve bases. When you do dots, I'll know that you want to set, in this case, the delete on termination attribute of the EBS map or the volume size on, on the EBS, right? I can go very flat. This is the same thing as this other inline one. Or I could have done a, a two square braces and started it. Like, there's lots of options in Tomo. This one's, the, I mean, if you're going to deeply set single values and very nested things, dot notation is super, super helpful. Um, but let's prove that, yes, this parse just like our first Tomo, but we're doing it the Tomo way and just kind of getting used to being vertical and flat. Uh, what's fun is that second Tomo example that didn't work because of the weirdness about curly braces, like that's valid HCL. Like HCL and Tomo for, turns out for real world use cases, they can be very similar um, or, let me put it another way. If you if you like the JSON stuff, but you don't want to do a lot of quoting, like HCL really falls into that. So again, just proving a lot of different form formats. But HCL says, yeah, do a lot of braces. And other than that, we're pretty pretty loose. Okay, now let's get to the part I really wanted to get to. I've been really nice to everybody. And I talk about the good stuff from these languages. Um, okay, can't deny it. When I first started writing the slide, I thought, well, JSON's the only one that can do one line element, right? JSON's the only thing that can say there's an entire big object of any size on one line. Spoiler alert, all of them can do one line objects with a little bit of finagling into them. <laughs> so JSON does one line arguments. Uh, um, this is, and this seems weird, but this is really common in like log files. Yeah. They love to log one line of JSON. There's a better way, it's YAML. And I'm gonna show you that YAML's better at logs than JSON. Um, but of course, YAML can do one line if you just give it the JSON, it'll be valid YAML. You can have the YAML, you can have YAML do it. Or you can do this really weird thing where you don't do quotes, but it gets really, really nitpicky about spacing. I wouldn't do this at the bottom line. I had to spend a lot of time finagling it, like making sure my spaces were right. But technically you can like get, you can drop the quotes and not make it exact JSON and still have it be valid YAML. So you see that second YAML parsed equally as well as the first YAML. Um, okay. Tom and HCL, like I said, you can't, if you just start any of those objects, or if you give either of those like a curly brace at the start, it's going to freak out. It says I have to have key equals something as 
as an element in there. So you can kind of finagle one line. All of them can get really flat as long as it's a key equal value on that line. Um, weird, but I use a little Go wrapper. And yeah, like you can kind of finagle those formats into one line formats if you want. Like JSON, everybody can do it. JSON's not that special. Um, what they are special about, and I've said this a lot, YAML and JSON say, send me any kind of thing I support and I will turn it into JSON or YAML and take it back out. Strings, Booleans, lists, there's no re restriction on what the root data type is for something I'm dealing with. Mm -hmm. So if I do all these, like, yeah, I can throw those at the parser and it can read them in and it can spit them back out. Um, people use JSON quoting a lot to send strings between things. So they're, they're super safe um, and like handle weird characters and stuff. I just quote, run your string through the JSON parser and then run it out the other end. Tomal, I'm going to try to do this, right? I'm going to send the, there's no key equals here. And it's going to, they're both going to say like, sorry, you have to have something equals something. Not a problem. They're, they're, they're both, they say we're document features. Documents are key values, deal with it. Now, everything, almost everything from here out is YAML magic. YAML magic number one, anchors. Anchors and references are for humans creating YAML documents just black magic awesomeness. They're almost, they're basically free variables and substitution. So in this case, I'm saying, here's a name attribute. And I, when you have an ampersand, I'm sorry, an ampersand and a variable name, it's gonna say, okay, whatever the value of after this is, I'm gonna store that in a variable called name. And when you use that, an asterisk and that variable name, I'm gonna take that value out. So what I'm gonna get here is I'm gonna get name equals Carson. And then I'm gonna get accounts ID equal one, name equals Carson. I'm going to get counts ID equal to name equals Carson. Like this is constants in your data format, which is super cool. Um, it's really only works one way. There's no canonical way to take this structure and like deduplicate serialize it the other way, right? It's almost entirely for like, give me configuration. I would never expect a computer edit this. Because how do you, there's a million ways you could slice this tape to put it the other direction. I'm not saying no one can do it. I'm just saying, generally speaking, if you write this back out in YAML, it'll write out the deduplicated or the, the duplicated format. Let's get more complex though. Just a string means nothing, right? Here's my name, Carson. Here's users. I'm giving this entire list item the variable of Carson. So I've got my name. I've got the list item one is Carson. That's using the name of Carson. Here's the accounts list. I'm giving account number one a variable. You'll notice you don't have to do it everywhere. I'm, I'm skipping it for account two. I'm saying I only care about duplicating account one. And it's reusing Carson, which is reusing name. And at the bottom, I'm saying the default account is account one. So this is all in one config, all this deduped all the way down to where the value of default account is the pre-rendered combination of all of my stuff parked all the way back up. So somebody can parse this with YAML and just read the default account and not care about anything else. Like they don't have to know what your logic is. Like you can just be bare bones with your code. Um, only YAML does this stuff and it's really, really cool. And you're like, this is weird, Carson, who uses this? Uh, Docker. If you wrote Docker compose files, they said, you duplicate environment variables a lot, right? If you have a stack, they all kind of need to know the database. The database is the same six variables everywhere. Like you can do this thing where you, this is a Docker compose convention, right? There's not a YAML spec. You saw I didn't have to do this weird X stuff in YAML before. Docker compose as a tool says, X whatever we ignore in the tool when we read that language, that's for you who are using variables. So you can say, here's the base environment of Fubon. And here's the first service that builds on, that has its own variable called first and V, and it builds on the base. It's going to take everything from base and merge it in. I'm not going to go into detail, but this double F braces is a YAML special thing that says, don't make a key called that, like combine that list or that map with this map. So the end result is first is going to have two environment variables. And because second is building on first, it's going to get three, right? So I can go all the way down as deep as I want. Most of the time you just do one top level one and reuse it, but you can see at the end, this is a way for changes at any level to just propagate to where they need to add configuration. Like Docker Compose isn't doing this as a, as a tool. It's not writing its own code to do this logic. This is just the YAML logic. So that's a super powerful YAML is like anchors and references for manual configuration and deduplication. It's like, this prevents errors, right? This saves you time and problems. Last thing, and I told you, YAML's better at streaming logs than JSON, right? Because it, we're all like, cool, one line per log JSON, but I can't read it as a human without JQ, right? Like if I get that, I'm trying to like watch those in a terminal, like 
I don't know, maybe I'm the only one who uses this, this anymore, but if I'm like watching things in terminals and I get a stream of JSON objects, like that's meaningless to me as a human because it's just too complex, especially when they're big, long, ugly JSON things. YAML says, look, you can do this thing called the document separator to do a, three hyphens in a row on their own line. And that says, I'm starting a new document now. And I, as, even in one data stream, in one file, in one network connection, whatever it is, it says, well, when you see three of these, okay, you're done talking about this first document. The next thing is now a new document entirely, not a list, not a map, like the next entire separate thing. Um, you might be tempted to put the trailing document separate at the end. I'll talk about why you don't. But you can see if I run this through my YAML parser, I got the first object, I got the second, and I got this weird empty object. Because for three hyphens, it says I'm starting a new document, right? So you can always put them at the start, and I often do, but you never put them at the end. If you want to do that, and I'll tell you why this exists, you can use three dots in YAML to say three hyphens, starting a new document, here's some things, three hyphens, new document, three dots, I am done. This seems weird and unnecessary, but if you're on a network connection, this disambiguates. Right, YAML is line based. So if you just stop sending, if I stopped sending data and I only sent this over a network connection, I would just have no piece of data. And my other side of my connection wouldn't know that the difference between we got disconnected versus I am done. Right? A little weird. Most people won't use it, but again, YAML is built for stream. Like it allows you to have these, like find things like one big stream of bytes that separates documents and does bursts of things. So if I hit play here, you'll see. It read that last three dots as like, okay, you're done. Disambiguated. I know for sure that you're done and I didn't just run out of like it disconnected halfway. Um, again, here's just another example of bursts of data. Like if this was my log lines, right? And they all started with hyphen and I could just tail those. And a computer can still be telling this, right? It knows that as soon as I see the next, either the next three hyphens or the next three dots, like that log entry is done. I'd rather tail this than, than JSON unless I have JP, right? Like, this would be a cool you'd be telling this and you'd see human readable entries for every line. Um, not saying you have to, but one line like is not the only way. There's better ways to do string. And uh, I have this app happen a lot. I do this all the time in my files when I'm writing through like Kubernetes manifests. I start all of my manifests with three hyphens. And they go like, why you don't it's optional. Why are you putting three three hyphens at the top of every YAML file you write by hand? Like it's optional, don't do it. And I say, it's optional. But if I do it, I can compose multiple YAML documents together by catting them. And I, like, I've got composition for free from files by just jamming them all together as long as the thing at the other end realizes the document separators exist. So this is really, really common in kubectl, saying here's this, this, and this, and I'm going to cat them all, send them to you in one. I don't have to run one command with one file, another command with another. I can build you one big file from three files, and you can just know that those are three separate documents without needing like to have them all be on one line like in json um so again just a super power of yaml that that three hyphens is actually really really useful and last or almost last nesting this is another thing so we're going to take uh this string this or, sorry this data struct and make it a string in each of the languages and you'll see what i mean here on the next slide so this is that data type in in every format we've seen, right? And I want to take these and pretend they're not data, that they're big complex strings. And I want to put that string, each of those four strings in a, into JSON as values or into Toml as values. Like this is weird, but how many times have we had to like, the struct says we can only put a string here. So we're just going to make JSON into JSON. And that's how we get things through APIs. Um, and it turns out some of these are better. So here's this, here's again, the four strings put as four keys in JSON. And JSON says double quotes and escape everything, right? And so you really quickly in nested JSON, get into backslash hell. Like, and we've all been there and go one level deeper and try to read anything. You can't. Nested JSON is unreadable. Um, nested J YAML and JSON, nested Tom, it doesn't matter what language you have, they all suck when you have to put them in JSON. So it's sort of weird, but if you're in Kubernetes land, YAML and YAML is actually really common. So let's go to YAML. Actually, sorry, let me hit play to prove this. So I'm going to parse this at the top, prove that they all came through raw strings. And then down here, we're just proving that, yes, I then took those and fed them through their respective processors. And they're real. Like, I didn't miss a quote. Like, this is just me proving to you that those are, that's valid JSON. And inside of that is the valid or other structures. YAML, block scalers. Block scalers of, I'm mixing and matching ones from my own preference to illustrate points here. 
here's that exact thing. Notice I don't have to escape anything in JSON other than this literal double quotes inside the string. That's a normal JSON thing. Um, nested YAML, this pipe hyphen is super magic. This just looks like YAML because it's right. Like that white spacing means that YAML and YAML reads incredibly well. Yes, it's a string, but if you're editing this by hand, I can go make changes to that nested string really well. And Kubernetes leverages this a lot. When you have beta features, when you have special behaviors, they have a field called annotations on every object in the API that is a key that you pair of string to string. And that's where people, when they're testing like weird behaviors and the, the API doesn't have a special place for whatever they're doing, they'll often put YAML in there to like have structured data represented in API where that structure is not efficient, right? Like, so it seems weird, but I, I promise you YAML and YAML is everywhere. Um, even Tom looks good in YAML. HCL looks good in YAML. They all look good because it's the significant white space thing and that um, sc block scalers of all their flavors let you write really long complex YAML strings that always look good. Um, which I absolutely love. And we do this, I just wrote something at Weave where we do this in our own, like we had a string, we had to use a string, but we have YAML, it's like, we're gonna put YAML in YAML and everybody can read it and it still looks good. And here's me proving out that, yep, they all parse and work well. Toml's not too bad. Toml's a little bit better, a lot better than JSON, not as good as YAML. You've got these triple quotes and double quotes. You kind of have the edge case of like, if you have Toml and Toml, and the Toml in your Toml has triple, like you can't, right? Like there, it has a limitation. Like the, the cool thing about the YAML is no matter how much YAML I do, there's no breakout. As long as the parser adds these spaces, as long as whatever's writing the YAML has the spaces, there's no escaping. Like once you're in a multi-line string, you're in it until you stop doing the leading space. There's no escapes. In JSON, there's escapes, by forgetting to escape a quote somewhere. In Toml, there's escapes if your nested strings have triple ticks. Like if, if the example I chose happened to have a really long multi-line string, like I'd have to use some sort of Toml that didn't do that. Um, but you can do it and it's not too bad. I'm gonna prove that these all, they're more readable. I'd rather do this than JSON still, they work. Uh, here's HCL. If you wanna do those exact things, again, trailing new lines excluded, you have to do these big like quoted things. I built the examples without trailing new lines to illustrate a point. Use here. Right, really, 99% of the time, if you're in Terraform, you can do this. And again, less than less than, and any string, and it'll go until it finds the end of that same string. Right? Again, breakouts are possible here because if your nested string happens to have EOL on its own line, like you're screwed. <laughs> um, so, like, there's gotchas in all of these, but they're more readable. They're absolutely more human readable. Most of the time, it's fine. Terraform, I do this with Bash scripts all the time. And if I hit play, there it goes. Those all parsed strings except for maybe the json where i had a bug and i didn't put it we'll pretend the json works what did i miss i don't know mr brace somewhere okay and the very very last thing is this isn't really related to languages it's the ecosystem around the language like if you are a system admin and you do not have jq installed install jq if you're working with json in any capacity um there's some really amazing, I could pull up examples, but JQ allows you to do some really complex like manipulations, like reading, if you're reading from a stream of log files, you can say, read all these and print these two fields from the, like, the stream of, of JSON entries, or like you can do just absolute, JSON is to JSON, like JQ is to JSON and bash what like grep is to text. Like it's that fundamentally powerful. It'd be like someone saying, well, I, yeah, I do a lot of stuff on the command line, but I never use grep to look through text. You're like, that's what it's for. So um, YQ also does it for YAML. It's not quite as good as JSON. It's getting a lot better. Um, sometimes I will convert things from YAML to JSON just to use JQ because it's super powerful for scripting. Um, so wrapping up, JSON says, there's one way, our way, the highway, do it. That's all you got. Um, but it keeps things clean. YAML, really flexible, maybe too flexible, um, but powerful, right? There's so many features that I described in YAML. And again, if you don't like the ambiguity, just close. Like the most problems people have is not quoting string. 99% of people's problems are solved like using nested scalers or do a lot of quoting. Um, Toml is actually really great for very simple use cases, but it can get weird with lots of very complex documents. And I don't think that weird double bracing is my preferred way to do list entries. It's unintuitive to me. Um, and ACL is kind of like a grab bag of all. So that's it. That's me talking for probably too long about those four things.
Online. I'll say too, this this is live. Um, this presentation, you can download it. You need to go and go present install, but they're going to get those easily. You can download this repo, run it locally, go through these hit play, um, or the slides are all in PDF form in the repo as well if you just want to reference any of this later. So, yeah. What are your favorite BSC extensions? Oh, BS code, sorry. Um, oh, man. Um, I don't think, I mean, I don't think the Go language tools count, <laughs> but yeah, Go <laughs> language tools. I don't use super fancy stuff from there. Um, a lot of the previous stuff, Markdown Preview, Mermaid Preview, I've been really doing a lot of documentation lately. And so having like a live preview of Mermaid to your docs has been amazing, especially now that GitHub supports them. So you don't have to like preview in GitHub to see what it looks like. Um, that's pretty much it. I don't get super fancy. I'm boring. I did. I, <laughs> uh, there's a comment on Steve on, online. He says YAML and YAML is also a useful tool for, for Helm templates. And if you want to pass a string of YAML with some template and box it in the template into your output. Mm -hmm. Yep. Also, use that. also, yeah, all of Helm's value files are YAML, right? And it allows you to do this cool stuff. Sweet. Of, of the, you know, there's so many different markup languages this And I think. If you're like me, I, I can I can work through them. This has been really helpful because I don't know all the details. And then when they get, you know, like the, like the type she had in there, like I don't know about that. Uh, but is there is there one that you find this overall this works the best? If I I mean it's standard advice I think if I'm doing computer computer stuff it's JSON. Yeah. And if I because that's least, it's the lowest common denominator, right? Least flexible but the lowest common denominator. Um, everything else is here. Like I don't even. I, I had to learn Toml because that's what Hugo, the Go static content generation utility, really likes. Um, so I learned some Toml just to like define some stuff for Hugo's configuration. But I find it like I, if it was me, I'm, I'm in YAML all the way. And I would also say if I had really, really large documents and I was worried about network capacity, yeah. And when things JSON, because it can be minified, will be smaller. But byte for byte, YAML can make smaller documents at a large scale. When you have all this optional quoting stuff going on, like you can just send a lot. Like those quotes add up. All those quotes add up fast, right? And YAML saying like, look, we can be really, really fast. Like if I had to be hyper efficient, maybe counterintuitively, some people would be like, yeah, YAML. Um, so I'd even break my own rules about computer stuff in some cases. Do you uh, redefine the nature or is it going to fail at first? No um, we can try that later. I've got some playgrounds. I'd be curious. Yeah, first, I've never seen like, a project been used. I didn't know like, uh, what it was like, I'm using like on my agent. Yeah. Like, what happened if you like had a bunch of those and tried to rename one? My, would it go through or would it explode? Would my it guess is they treat a lot like the math keys and be like, I've already seen this anchor. What are you talking about? So they don't, but, but. Yeah, they seem to not like it. Any other questions? Don't just uh, binary formats like photo buffer fit into this discussion for you. Um, we use them all the time. Love photo buff, right? Um, but it's not for human eye. Like it's just not right. There's no, there's no. I, I don't think I couldn't put it in here because we'd all just be staring at a like X. <laughs> it's like, here you go. Here's the bytes, I guess. Um, I love them. Like I, let, let's be honest. If I'm doing stuff internally, like we, 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 we are all in internally on proto buff. But everything we find in proto is a JSON equivalent or when it's got the access by public API. Yeah. So the public edge, we're still saying for public people, it's internally we actually, we do GRPC into our own stuff with our own utilities, but lowest common denominator is like, yeah, it's JSON. but the JSON is generated based on a proto buff declaration. Or not proto buff, uh, yeah, proto buff. So, yeah, I love them. I, I use it all the time, but it doesn't help you when you're doing stuff like that. Yeah, one thing that we've learned is if you are using, if you use, in some situations, you use YAML and then you have to look at like, what data structure is supported by both of them. Mm -hmm. And it turns out, Protobuf doesn't support either one, but one does. 
So if you extract the program, definitely you want to look at what you shouldn't be doing and what requirements you want to get from the program. So yeah, and, and this is really so uh he works with, with me for the team. Um <laughs> this is from context. Uh we had a really complex YAML document internally that we used before we really got heavy on protobuf. And we said, cool, let's convert this YAML document into a protobuf. And it, we couldn't. There are patterns in our data that protobuf says you can't do that. Um Go allow it. Like I think our biggest one is we use Go structs with like vetted structs and some like weird nesting stuff to like here's a type and move all the keys from this type like some Go specific neatness that deduplicates stuff for us. Um, and yeah, and protobuf like if you start a protobuf, it'll always work in YAML, but you can't go the other way. You might be able to write the YAML documents that won't be translatable directly to protobuf of the specs. I mean, to me. Protobuf had one advantage was a, was a way to save a whole bunch of money if you're sending messages through both so. No, and you're right. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that's true. If, if we're talking about absolute computer speed and I wanted efficiency, yeah, you can't be Protobuf for size. So. And parsing speed and like his life. Well, that's a good point. Yeah, none of those are really pressed for speed. It wouldn't be MRJ yeah, something to be Protobuf. Anybody else? Well, like I said, there's all this is on there if you want to run it. Um, I'm also going to plug my guts of Git talk. Um, if you have done that, that uh, there's a repo um, under my carcinoid at GitHub. It's got a link to this whole web page that dives through this level of detail that like, the one I kind of ran earlier. People don't know get. There's a self-guided uh, workshop that I made for DevOps Day about Git that if you like this kind of weird nerdy detail about cool things, you like to get. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. Thanks again. Still have uh, pizza left. A lot of pizza left. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, if you if you're interested in presenting, probably the best is just going to meet up and connect to one of the organizers, and uh, we'll we'll review it and get it scheduled, and we'll get this posted in the next next few hours, probably. Thanks again, Carson. Yeah, happy to do it.